use the term fantasy. Is this something you are doing for your personal pleasure? Uh, sexual fantasy, sir. The BTK serial killer has 10 confirmed victims, but it's long been presumed that there are more out there. Now, 18 years after he was caught, BTK is once again the prime suspect in cold cases dating back to the 70s. And his own hubris might be what leads investigators to more potential victims. BTK stands for Bind, Torture, Kill, and it's the moniker that serial killer Dennis Rader gave himself. Now, pretty much everyone in the true crime community has heard of BTK, but since he was captured so long ago, you might be unfamiliar with the details. Dennis Rader, the man we now know as BTK, is currently serving 10 consecutive life sentences for murder. BTK terrorized the Wichita area for 30 years, and Rader's reign of terror came to an end when he was finally captured in 2005. But a multi-agency task force was recently formed to investigate possible connections between BTK and several unsolved cases. Dennis Rader has always prided himself on controlling the narrative around his case. Long before he was caught, he taunted the police and the media with cryptic and disturbing communications. Even now, from behind bars, he still seems to kind of hold all the cards. So it was a bit of a shock to Dennis Rader to learn that he was being seriously investigated again. BTK exclusively talked to us at the Daily Mail from prison about the developments. In a message sent from the El Dorado Correctional Facility in Kansas, Rader said that he thought things were, quote, starting to cool off with him, but added, you never know with the law. Rather than cooling off, things are only heating up. Dennis Rader is currently the prime suspect in at least two unsolved murders, according to law enforcement. Now, BTK was a trophy killer. He took morbid mementos from his victims and kept them, often squirreling them away in little hidey holes. On August 23rd, the Osage County Sheriff's Office executed a search of Raider's former residence looking for more of these trophies. And the reason they were tipped off to the possibility of more hidden trophies from unknown victims was a clue left by BTK himself in an excerpt from a 47-year-old personal journal. Now, this is a common thread throughout BTK's morbid biography. Raider liked to leave investigators little clues about his crimes for them to kind of puzzle out. Now, cops say this entry of Raider's referred to a significant event that he named PJ Bad Wash Day. I know that sounds like gibberish, but he used to call his victims projects and abbreviated that to PJ. The journal entry is disturbing. In it, he writes that a brunette was the target and that he would watch her at the laundromat. Now, in that context, bad wash day makes a little bit more sense. There are a lot of misspellings in this line and it doesn't really flow, but it's particularly chilling. Quote, Laundry mat were a good place to watch victims and dream. Sometime I have a pair of women underwear on and after watching a girl or lady relieve myself in bathroom with masturbation's thoughts. Now the brunette referenced in this journal entry may be this missing teen, Cynthia Kinney, who was last seen at a laundromat in Oklahoma. At the time of her disappearance, Raider was known to be out of the Wichita area. See, he was a regional installer for ADT and cops believe that he was in Oklahoma installing a new alarm system at a bank across the street from the laundromat. Investigators are working on the theory that BTK abducted and murdered Kinney and then buried her in a barn on the border between Oklahoma and Kansas. Now, that barn detail strikes me as pretty specific considering their only lead is that line from a journal entry. But remember when I said at the top of this video that it might be Raider's own hubris that implicates him in more crimes? Well, when he was arrested, he had a bunch of detailed colored hand drawings of dead women in barns and police say that one of those depictions precisely matches one of the known BTK crime scenes. So their reasoning is this, the rest might be illustrations of other victims we haven't found yet. Now, BTK has been incarcerated for more than 15 years and his old home was razed to the ground in 2006. But a few weeks ago, investigators dug up the concrete and allegedly found what they described as trophies belonging to a female as well as bondage materials. Prior to that, in April, a ligature made of pantyhose was also found on the property. The sheriff's department is also looking beyond Cynthia Kinney's open case, and they said that their investigation, quote, uncovered potential connections to other missing persons cases and unsolved murders in the Kansas and Missouri areas, which are possibly linked to Dennis Rader. Now, how Rader chose his victims was somewhat random. In court transcripts, Rader explained that he would identify many projects, which we all know is code for potential victims, but there were far more projects than there were actual murder victims because, as BTK explained it to the judge, if one didn't look like it was going to work out, he would just quickly pivot his plan to the next one. 
BTK's killings were all premeditated, but not planned that well, especially in the beginning with the first four who were all killed together in 1974, the Otero family. Joseph and Julie Otero were murdered by BTK alongside their two young children, Joseph and Josie. Now, as his moniker suggests, they were bound, tortured, and then killed. During court, BTK told the judge that he panicked during the Otero murders because he hadn't anticipated that Mr. Otero would be home when he broke in. Now, these first kills were a mess in regards to planning. Raider hadn't worn a mask, so once the family saw his face, he basically could not back out. Quote, they already could ID me, and I made a decision to go ahead and put them down. Now, Raider was completely inexperienced at taking a human life at this point. In court transcripts, he revealed that Julie Otero was the first person he had ever strangled. Now, he thought he had killed Julie and Josie by choking them to death, but he'd actually only knocked them out. They passed out and came to a short while later. And when he tried to suffocate Joseph Jr. with a bag, the nine-year-old boy tore a hole through it in an attempt to save his own life. But after finally going back and killing those three Oteros, he took 11-year-old Josie downstairs and he hung her. It was only after that that Raider masturbated. Some of his semen was actually found near her body. Another man confessed to the Otero murder, so Raider contacted the local media and sent them to the library to uncover a hidden letter about the Otero murders. And in it, he named himself. He named himself BTK, and he said he had done it, and also promised that he would leave that BTK moniker as his calling card for the next victim. That same year, he was lying in wait at the home of Catherine Bright, ready to kill her when she arrived home with a relative, Kevin Bright. Now, that wasn't part of the plan, and Raider ended up scuffling with Kevin, who managed to shoot BTK in the arm and escape. Catherine fought back, but ultimately, she was stabbed to death. Three years later, BTK was active again. In 1977, he strong-armed his way into the home of Shirley Vianne by pretending to be a private detective. Once in the house, he revealed that he had, quote, a problem with sexual fantasies and that he was going to tie her and her children up. Now, Shirley was cooperative, and she actually helped Raider lock her children in the bathroom, quote, with toys and blankets and odds and ends in there for the kids to make them as comfortable as we could. Now, I think Shirley was really just trying to protect her children by doing what she was told and likely hoped that by giving the man what he wanted, he would spare her life. But BTK needed to satiate himself, and he, quote, tied her up and put a bag over her head and strangled her. Four more women would be strangled to death by BTK in the years between 1977 and 1991. Nancy Jo Fox, Maureen Wallace Hedge, Vicki Lynn Weggerly, and Dolores Johnson Davis. Now, those last two were strangled with pairs of pantyhose. So this makes the pantyhose ligature that was recently found on BTK's property by police even more suspicious. And Vicki Lynn Weggerly had scratched her killer. His DNA was obtained from under her fingernails. While he spent years committing these series of heinous murders and sowing fear into the greater Wichita community, BTK outwardly seemed like an average guy. Dennis Rader was married to a woman named Paula. They had two kids, Carrie and Brian. For many years, he worked for ADT. And at the height of the BTK panic in Wichita, Rader would install security systems at people's homes who were frightened of BTK. So how is that for some sick irony? He asked, do you know who BTK is? I was like, you mean the person that's wanted for murders back in Kansas? Your dad has been arrested as BTK. And I was like, I think I'm gonna pass out. It wasn't just the murders that Raider seemed to enjoy. He relished in taunting the police and the public with all of the gory details. He frequently contacted both law enforcement and the media with explicit communications detailing some of the more sadistic methods of torture that he used. And the police would talk back to BTK through news articles. In the years following his last kill, Raider would bind himself while wearing women's clothing and wear this macabre mask here, and he'd pose for photos, later admitting that this was a way to reenact his murders by pretending to be his victims. Now, this was all, of course, part of his sick sexual fantasy. He was finally captured in 2005 after making a grave error in one of his communications with the public. His final letter was sent via a floppy disk, and if you are really young and you don't know what that is, it's this thing right here. He saved his anonymous document on this floppy disk and he sent it to the local Fox affiliate along with a necklace and a photocopy of a book about a serial killer. Raider didn't know though. The disk had hidden metadata buried within a deleted document. That document had last been modified by someone named Dennis and it was related to the Christ Lutheran Church. It did not take long to discover that a Dennis Raider was the president of the church council. But this wasn't enough for an arrest. Investigators needed to connect Raider to the DNA from the Weggerly murder for something really solid. So a warrant was obtained to test 
the pap smear of Raider's daughter, Carrie, which she had done at the Kansas State University Medical Center. So unbeknownst to Carrie, she had helped take down her own father and unmask BTK. She did not have a clue that her dad was living a secret life as a serial killer until he was arrested. Now, Carrie never saw her father again after his 2005 arrest. That is, until this summer, when she surprised him with a jailhouse visit. Carrie Rawson immediately volunteered to aid the newly formed BTK task force, and she exclusively revealed to Daily Mail that she tried to wheedle information from her dad about the current open investigations into more possible victims. But time is ticking if there is any hope of BTK confessing to more kills. Carrie says that his health is ailing and at 78 years old, he's in a wheelchair. She thinks that her father's days are numbered. Despite being interviewed as recently as last week by investigators about these open cases, through his attorney, BTK has denied any involvement. Search Daily Mail videos on Facebook for more clips like this. For more true crime content like this, hit like and subscribe.